Hello, my name is Brett Fairbairn and this video about Founders of Credit Unions is available for your use under a Creative Commons license that allows you to share it freely as long as you attribute it to its original source, the Centre for the Study of Cooperatives at the University of Saskatchewan. Credit unions are financial cooperatives and like all cooperatives they serve the people who are their members. But let's um, uh, reflect for a few minutes about some of the people who are famously associated with the creation of credit unions. One of the first people in the world to come up with the idea of a financial cooperative to serve members was a man named Hermann Schulze Delitzsch. Um, his name was Schulze, he came from the town of Delitzsch in Saxony, Germany, so he's known as Schulze Delitzsch. And he was a, a politician, a parliamentarian in the middle of the 19th century, a member of the German Progressive Party, a party that believed in things like civil liberties and free trade and a small role for government. So he wanted to find a way to help the artisans who was, whose economy was in difficulty at the time and a self-help solution for them rather than a solution that would have them rely on aid from the state. Um, so in the 1850s, in the aftermath of the um, uh, troubles of the 1840s, bad economy, revolutions in Germany, he developed the idea of cooperatives and he put his legal training to work. As a parliamentarian and a legal scholar, he defined the idea of credit unions and eventually he helped draft legislation for cooperatives that helped facilitate their creation. Um, so Hermann Schulze Delitzsch was certainly a founder of the credit union movement and one of its first thinkers and legal scholars. Now there were two famous founders of credit unions in mid-19th century Germany and the other one was a man by the name of Friedrich Wilhelm Reifeisen. Reifeisen was a rural mayor in the state of Prussia in a, uh, an impoverished area in the Rhine province of, uh, of the state of Prussia and he was concerned about the plight of farmers. As an official in the government of Prussia, Reifeisen felt the people of his territory were under his care and when he observed their distress in the 1840s with bad harvests and economic downturns, he began to set about forming associations to help people in need. After experimenting for more than a decade with philanthropic associations, Reifeisen borrowed the idea of cooperation from Schulze Delitzsch and began to organize um, associations to help people in which the people receiving the assistance would be members. So instead of philanthropy, Reifeisen was now working on an idea of self-help. But Reifeisen's cooperatives still included important philanthropic elements. He felt that his credit cooperatives should be for all the people in a village, the local landlord, the mayor, the priest, not just the farmers who would be the, the ones who needed credit from the cooperative. So they really represented a cross-section of rural society. And as they spread, it was frequently the case that the local mayor would be the chair of the credit union, the local priest would be the secretary, and the members of the clergy in many cases were the ones who spread the idea. Um, so once again, one of the things we see here is a person with contacts, a person with, uh, with connections, with status in society, promoting credit unions, enlisting the aid of others, and creating enterprises that were intended to serve the needs of the common person. The credit union idea spread internationally by some really interesting routes. One of the people who picked it up was a man by the name of Alphonse Desjardins in Canada. Desjardins was a uh, clerk in the House of Commons in Ottawa, one of the people who prepared Hansard for Parliament. He was um, a member of the Conservative Party, connected to the Conservative Party in Canada, um, and was concerned about the problem of usury that he saw in rural places, of people being exploited by uh, excessive interest rates. And in his case, he was particularly concerned for the Catholic and French Canadian population in his home province of Quebec. Desjardins corresponded with the leaders of the credit union movement in Europe, with Schulze Delitzsch, with Reifeisen, uh, with the man by the name of Luzzati, who'd founded similar associations in, uh, in Italy and with others. And he came up with a made in Canada kind of credit union that he referred to as a caisse populaire or a people's bank. Um, so Desjardins' movement of, of credit unions, of caisse populaire, started to spread beginning in the very beginning of the 20th century. The very first one was founded in his hometown of Lévis across the river from Quebec City in 1901. And by the 1920s, the movement was starting to spread um, through, uh, through Quebec. 
Um, so the credit union idea had hopped across the Atlantic. It had found another patron, another sponsor, um, in this case someone with political and government connections and with the ability to correspond, to define ideas, to get legislation introduced and passed. Um, Desjardins had connections in the United States and his ideas spread from Quebec into the U.S. where they came to the attention of a, um, um, an industrialist, a wealthy um, um, owner of department stores and other enterprises, a man by the name of Edward Filene. And Filene had a number of projects. He tried uh, converting some of his uh, stores to cooperatives to help the workers. But when he heard about Desjardins' idea of credit cooperatives, that seemed to him to be a great idea to introduce in the United States. So Filene put his personal fortune to work. He created a foundation. He hired a staff person by the name of Roy Bergengren. And Filene and Bergengren basically went across the United States getting legislation for credit unions passed in one state after another. And as the legislation was introduced, as the idea of people's banks or credit unions spread further and further, more and more of them were created until they became a national movement. And in fact, the credit union movement in the United States uh, today in 2016 is the largest credit union movement in any country in the world. Um, so from Europe to Quebec to the United States, and then as a, as a Canadian, I'm certainly interested in how the idea spread to other parts of Canada, and it was kind of re-imported from the United States back into Canada by way of what was called the Antigonish movement in Nova Scotia, and then it came out west to places like my home province of Saskatchewan. Um, in the early years, in my province, in Saskatchewan, credit unions were founded much as they had been defined by the leaders of the time as closed bond organizations for people who shared a common workplace, a common ethnicity, or a common religion. So the very first credit union formed in my province of Saskatchewan after legislation was passed in 1937 was the Regina Hebrew Savings and Credit Union. Its purpose was that it helped mobilize the uh, Jewish community in Regina and in Saskatchewan to help finance the settlement of uh, refugees, of immigrants uh, who were escaping from Nazi Germany, of Jewish immigrants who were escaping from Nazi Germany. So that was how the credit union, by a long circuitous route, uh, came to Saskatchewan. And one other um, local story then that uh, is significant for the development of credit unions in this part of the world is that there was um, um, a small town merchant, a man by the name of T.H. Bourassa, in the town of La Flèche, Saskatchewan. And in the 1930s, in the midst of the Depression, he looked at his community and what he saw is that the banks were withdrawing services. They weren't lending to people in need in rural Saskatchewan in the 1930s. He observed that the banks, the big banks in Canada, were happy to accept people's deposits, but they weren't lending in the rural communities where people were in need. So in his view, as a local business person, he saw that uh, private banks were sucking capital out of rural places and making them more impoverished. And he seized on credit unions as a way for people to recirculate money within their communities and reinvest it in the local economy. Um, the kind of credit union that he promoted, the La Flèche Credit Union, became the first of a new model that was really a community credit union rather than a credit union just for an occupational or religious group. And that model of a credit union to recirculate wealth in rural communities to support local businesses and farmers and people in need is one that then spread widely in Canada ever since. So this is an interesting history of how an idea traveled internationally, of how it was promoted uh, by people who had status, who had connections, who had wealth to put to work in order to uh, secure the legislation, in order to get the credit union started. But this raises some interesting questions because cooperatives are founded to serve people in need. The definition of a cooperative, the root of the idea, is an enterprise that serves people who have needs. So what do we make about the fact that all of these men in the 19th and early 20th centuries, uh, people who didn't themselves need the services of a credit union, were ones who played key roles in legitimizing the idea, getting the legislation passed, and getting the credit union started? Well, I think one of the things it illustrates about the nature of cooperatives, and especially about the cooperative development process, 
is that many cooperatives, although they may be for people in need, effectively have a kind of a multi-stakeholder character. They include community supporters, they include uh, sometimes workers and employees, people who want to make the cooperative a success, uh, who wanted to create credit unions in this case for the good of a community. So the story of the origins of cooperatives, of the founders of credit unions, is a story that's international. It's a story that blends from philanthropy to self-help, and it's a story that illustrates some fascinating dynamics of the cooperative development process.